Welcome to the latest conversation on global education. Uh, our chance to talk to thought leaders from around the world on what matters most around 21st century learning. And today I'm delighted we're joined by Charlie Ledbetter, a distinguished thinker uh, and writer on many uh, aspects of innovation and most recently uh, has travelled uh, at Cisco's invitation to uh, literally a hundred extraordinary places where learning is happening in ways that we never thought it would. So, uh, Charlie, uh, if we can begin, as you look back on this extraordinary range of experiences, um, is there any one uh, memory that comes to mind that sums it up for you and uh, uh, would allow us to have some insight into the experience that you've had? Well, I suppose the day that I remember most is uh, a day in a place called the Madangir Resettlement Colony, which is a kind of semi-official slum on the edge of Delhi. It's about 25 minutes outside of Delhi. And I spent it with um, a gaggle of teenage girls who just finished secondary education. And they were trying to explain to me what it was like trying to become educated in a place like that, which is um, overrun with people, dusty, hot, disconnected from the centre of town um, and the entrance to the slum uh, which is a narrow pathway is where boys and girls trot in and out in their uniforms to go to the nearby school but it's also where um, Sagata Mitra put uh, his computers in the hole in the wall experiment to allow self-organised learning and it was the combination of the two really and seeing the schools that they went to that should really be, are still a source of hope. And yet, really, what they were saying was what made them really excited about learning was these computers and the way that it opened up learning as something that could be about fun, discovery, enjoyment, collaborative in the real world. Um, and in a sort of ess in essence, that little kind of vignette um, summed up what was going on in a lot of these places huge hope for education absolute hunger for it, um, incredible appetite to learn in new ways, and traditional systems, if not failing, certainly failing to keep... You called your report, Charlie, needed. Learning from the Extremes. Interesting title. And I wondered what you wanted to convey by that. Well, what I meant was that when we think about innovation in education, we often think, I think, that we, we, we go to places like Finland or... South Korea or the best schools in Canada or Australia and look at what the best are doing and then learn from that and try and distill that message and see how it can be spread. My idea instead was to do what people do sometimes in innovation programs, which is look at the most extreme environments where resources are scarce but demand is high because it's in those environments you might see radical innovation. And so I wanted to go to places... Um, with exploding young populations, with very few resources, but a need to meet educational demand. And those are the big cities of the developing world. Uh, and so I think you can learn things from those environments that you don't learn by looking at the best schools in Finland. You get a different perspective. Much of innovation turns on the perspective you take, the framing, the kind of question that you ask, the vantage point that you take. And seeing from that vantage point, what you need are mass, self-help, networked, bottom-up forms of learning of a kind that we don't yet have. And if you look at the things that work in those environments, the key thing that works all over the world is the mobile phone. So you need something akin to the mobile phone that reaches into people's lives in a much more effective way. With such a wide array of learning experiences under your microscope, I guess that's why you felt you needed a strong organising device and you, uh, you went for something which you call, I think, the innovation quadrant that looks at four different ways um, of, uh, of, of improving or transforming school-age education. Uh, can you say a bit about how that quadrant works in your view? Well, I think that when uh, we went around and looked at all the different things that we saw, um, some in schools, some public schools, some not public schools, lots of projects not in school, outside school, in communities and families, we saw four basic things. We saw efforts to improve schools. So all around the world, people are trying to improve schools, better equipment, uh, better buildings, better books, and crucially and critically, better teachers. Um, so everyone is trying to do that. 
problem with that in the developing world, often difficult to get teachers, um, often difficult to get well-motivated and well-trained teachers. And so uh, that's a long-term strategy. The second thing that we saw was people trying to reinvent schools and remake them. So they're recognisably still schooled as places of learning, but they were organised in different ways. They had more open spaces, they were more collaborative, they mixed up years, they used computers in imaginative ways, they had uh, more open, personalised curricula, which depended more on exploration. And you see efforts to reinvent schools all over the world, to, to take the school and kind of bend it and reshape it. Those uh, can work, but my experience is that they're often uh, kept at the margins of education systems. They're, they're often great stories and uh, impressive single examples, but it's very difficult to make systemic change. The third thing that we saw was people saying, well, actually, the key thing is not just school, it's school, family and community, and it's the relationship between the two And if you can invest more and more intelligently in families and how they learn and how they prepare children and support children at school, it's the combination of the two, how family supplements school that that works. And there you see amazing schemes like the Harlem Children's Zone in, in the developed world or Reggio Emilia in Italy, of course. But you see very simple and very effective things like Pratham's amazing network of Balwadi's preschool groups in India and their support for poorer children at school. So you see sort of combinations of sort of supplementing school with support outside school. And then finally, what you see are efforts to really transform education because maybe you can't get schools. Schools don't exist because you don't have resources. You can't employ teachers. Even if you could employ teachers, what they have to teach isn't relevant or useful to the lives of the people who they're trying to help because you're working in very extreme and poor conditions. And so there you see people like Sagata Mitra, the creator of Hole in the Wall, or uh, Pratham in India, or the Barefoot College in India, or um, CDI in Latin America, developing ways of, of teaching and learning which are completely different. And the key difference is that they try and pull people to learning rather than sort of pushing it at them. It's it's much more about motivation and attraction than it is about compulsion and enforcement of a set curriculum within years and what have you. I think we saw all four of those going on. Invent, uh, improve existing schools, reinvent them, supplement them, and attempt to transform. And, of course, in the very best systems in the world, Finland you probably see all four of those strategies being deployed at the same time. But my story about the the developing world is that it's those transformational attempts, finding new, low-cost, more effective ways to reach people at scale, en masse, uh, with learning, which are going to be most relevant. And indeed, they might be quite relevant to many of our challenges in the developing world as well. Well, at the heart of all of this, there's the problem of fixing education. Um, But the problems seem very, very different. On the one hand, how do you provide low-cost and yet quality education for millions of people who frankly never had that, nor their parents, nor their grandparents? And on the other hand, you're trying to address the rather familiar culture of failure, or at least underperformance, um, in developed world school systems. Uh, Did you ever feel that this was too compendious a set of problems to be looking at. In actual fact, you were yanking together things that belonged in quite different worlds. Well, there clearly are big differences. I mean, when you're dealing with established school systems, which um, have ingrained successes but also failures, cultures, buildings, professions, regulation, this is very different from looking at societies which are still developing school systems and where simply getting kids into school is a huge achievement. So they are clearly very different. But actually, the more that I looked at it, the more that I thought there were some common features to the problems and common features to the solutions. The common feature to the problem is that actually when you look at where in the developed world our systems most fail they're often ingrained social and cultural failures amongst very poor communities which are disinvested in multiple ways. 
and where school often seems irrelevant or uh, not part of the story of these people's lives, education seems very distant. In the developing world, you have large numbers of young people in these fast-growing cities for whom, again, education seems quite distant in some way, as something that's not very relevant to their lives. And actually, some of the solutions are the same, in the sense that, one, if I put it in one word, it's about motivation. It's about whether you can really motivate people to want to learn and make learning available in forms that reinforces that investment that people want to make in it. So it's a problem, if you like, fundamentally, of personal and cultural investment in that. So in both these settings, we have issues of families. If you look at the, the, the toughest places to teach in the developed world, some of our biggest problems are to do with families, culture and community, aspirations to learn. If you look in the developing world, biggest challenge, biggest challenge is we have first generation learners in their millions. So we have hundreds of millions of parents who are for the first time being parents of children, children at school. And it's a completely new experience. So actually, if we just focused on what it is to create cultures of learning in families and in communities that support learning, these are very, very similar sorts of challenges. And um, some of the solutions, I think, are also quite similar. So if the argument is that there are things that we can all take from the extraordinary learning experiences going on in Nairobi, Venezuela, wherever it may be, if that's the argument, can you just pin down for us what you think the defining features are of what you call disruptive innovation uh, in informal settings? What really characterises what you saw in India, um, in Caracas, wherever it may be? Well, I think what you see is people doing without much of the sort of paraphernalia of a school system. They often don't have schools. They piggyback on other buildings. They often don't employ fully qualified teachers. Um, they employ paraprofessionals or um, peers to, to lead learning. So learners become teachers in some sort of secular process. Uh, often there's no set curriculum that they start from. They start from problems that people have or skills that they need to learn to deal with a problem or to earn a living or to deal with a health issue. So the whole notion of the curriculum doesn't have as much relevance. It has to come from what people are facing in their lives. They depend heavily on motivation. So either extrinsic motivation, come and learn this because it will do something for you. It will help you earn a living or uh, improve your li life in some way. Or intrinsic motivation, come and learn this because it's fun. And they often do that by the, the learning coming through something else. So the, the most famous example, the Sistema in Venezuela, um, classical music and violins, that is a technology for learning. It's a technology for getting people into learning through enjoying playing music, just as the computer can be a technology for learning, just as sport, in a way, can be a technology for learning. So they emphasise this learning through. First hook them and then get them to learn, whereas often... You know, in our school systems, those things are sort of add-ons, aren't they? They are things you do after school. You do sport and music and drama after school. In these systems, they often do it the other way around. And so they, they're dealing with people who have to be attracted to learning because the other things going on in their lives are so um, pressing, the need to earn a living or to look after siblings or to help with a family business or you know, the attractions of the drug trade or whatever it may be, that you need to really kind of pull people into it and hold their attention because what you're doing is really vital. So what you see in these settings are people devising different approaches to learning that you wouldn't see in well-developed settings. And I think if you took some of those approaches, that logic, and then applied them to you know, the outer suburbs of Paris or to the devastated inner cities of parts of America or indeed some of our worst pockets of edu educational inequality in this country, in the UK, you might get different solutions and you might well get better solutions than simply relying on better schools. So well, I came, came away feeling that better schools are almost inevitably part of the solution but never the sole solution. Let's just focus on one characteristic then, what you've called the para-teacher, um, and think about how that might relate 
to a developed world system. And we've seen certainly the role of the teacher shift a lot, theoretically, in the developed world over the last five, ten years. Um, far more of the enabler, um, but uh, less present in the learning setting, but um, very much the pedagogue, uh, understanding deeply effective strategies for teaching and learning. You're arguing something different, that the para-teacher is not that expert in teaching and learning, but rather a, a participant, an observer, uh, but someone who comes from somewhere else. And I'm wondering what the, the, the value you see in that figure as being in Paris, as you say, or a London or a Boston. Well, all, all over the place, what I found was people trying to get learning to children, young people, without being able to employ teachers, or the teachers not being relevant or able to teach in a way that was uh, appropriate. And so just three things that I, that I remember seeing. Uh, one was Siddhartha Mitra in the slums of Hyderabad explaining how he got children to learn using computers in groups with a figure he called the granny. And the granny would simply sit there and ask them questions and get them to go off and do tasks and get, come back and get them to tell her what they'd done and it was simply a kind of someone organizing a sort of interrogation or questioning using a computer um in many places cdi in favelas in latin america i saw people leading learning who had themselves been learners in those very programs just a few years before and so they were very cyclical kind of um, programs they recycled their talent if you like Learners became teachers and supervisors and designers of, of learning. And that gave them a sort of connection to the people learning. They were role models as well. And then I saw um, people working alongside teachers who had specific skills that might be relevant. They knew about art or medicine or the environment. And they had a specific skill that could be in some way combined with the skill of a teacher to create a different kind of package. But if you're, if you're working in these places, you know, and anyone who speaks English or has mathematical skills is going to go and find a job in a call center or in a hotel or in a restaurant or in some part of the global economy that pays a wage, then the people who are left teaching are often uh, poorly motivated and, and, and difficult to get. So we have to somehow reimagine what the global workforce for learning could be like. And part of the solution will be to find people who can do bits of the job or parts of it in different ways. And if a key part of it is motivation, can I get you to want to learn? Can I really relate to you? Can I understand where you're coming from and understand the problems that you bring to school? Um, then that's important. And those are no mean problems, because in Nairobi, um, you know, you can go to virtually any school in a slum in Nairobi, and half the kids will have parents who are HIV positive. Many of them will have no parents at all. I mean, these kids are bringing issues to school which are immense um, before they can even consider to start that. It struck me that um, if you look at what you saw in Latin America, as opposed to what you saw in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, the motivation idea worked in different ways. Um, typically, at least often, as I saw it in Latin America, you were, you were appealing to young people's passions. It might be their interest in sport, it might be their interest in music. Whereas in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, you were appealing to their sense of what was possible uh, as entrepreneurs. Um, what might motivate them there would be what they could do with their lives and how they might make money for themselves and their families and, and reach fulfillment that way. And I wonder whether you did see that, the distinction that I did in reading your report and what your reflections were in terms of the effectiveness of the two approaches, one around passions, the other, as it were, around um, material interest. Well, yeah, I hadn't made that, um, I hadn't made that distinction in, in geographic terms. I think there is that distinction um, in, in the kind of schemes that I looked at and the projects that I looked at. Um, I think that uh, it's certainly in India, there is a kind of... Well, a lot of these people living at the bottom of the period, they're entrepreneurs, basically. The, the, the poor economy down there is a micro-enterprise economy where people will have multiple jobs. The jobs might be you know, pushing a barrow, running a vegetable stall and helping clean a shop or something. But they're essentially, what we need to do is train people for a micro-entrepreneurship economy in that world. 
And so the relevant skills were to acquire, you know, skills that would then have some sort of economic value or use. And the Barefoot College, most famously in Bihar, teaches people really useful skills, building solar panels, um, creating clean water, you know, kind of things that will pr- solve economic and practical problems for communities. Um, and then a lot of the schemes, you're right, in, in Latin America that I looked at, really did have this sort of dance, music, sport. Through that, you bring learning to people. You engage people through a different kind of interface. It's not a school as the interface. It's a football as the interface or a violin as the interface. Um, and I think that they, they all play in different ways. But underlying all of it is, is a sense that education needs a different economic model perhaps. It needs, a, it needs to bring forward the economic payoffs of education. They often take too long to pay off for these communities. You need to show that you can deliver an economic payoff quicker. Um, but also that a lot of the stuff that might seem quite trendy about appealing to people's passions and creative education, actually that is really basic stuff in these communities because that's the way you get people to learn. It's not trendy kind of arty stuff. It's actually how you get people hooked into learning rather than part of the drug scam. I was interested in the use of technology and I guess in particular digital technology in the learning settings that you saw. Uh, Clearly Hole in the Wall uh, turns on the use of computers uh, in India. But um, in many, I suspect, of the other 99 cases, there wasn't much technology at all. What reflections do you have after this experience um, about the role that technology can and should play in driving forward learning, even uh, in uh, disruptive and informal settings? Well, first of all, I think technology of all kinds plays a role. So in a sense, uh, the Sistema in Venezuela is using the violin as a technology for learning. Uh, Other people are using photography or dance or sport as technologies for learning in a way. So the first thing to say is is, is have quite a pragmatic and open account of what a technology for learning might be. Um, The second is that, you know, in all those examples, improving schools, reinventing them, supplementing with helping the community, technology can play a role, digital technology can play a role. Because, of course, in improving schools, you can do that using computers. You can, lots of examples of people reinventing schools with Wi-Fi networks and, you know, kind of virtual learning zones and what have you. So technology can play a role in these different settings. But in that transformational and disruptive setting, what was most powerful often was education plus digital technology equals hope, basically. When you have people who are hungry to learn and you give them access to these really powerful tools and they don't even necessarily need to be connected to the internet just loaded with appropriate software learning can explode and so I was absolutely convinced those girls I met in that um, slum in Delhi they had never touched Wikipedia they had never Google searched they weren't on Facebook they knew nothing about how to use the web for educational resources it was a completely other world if you gave them access to that resource, it, they would just take off, I think. And we have, you know, the big opportunity of all this stuff is what it will mean for those hundreds of millions of young people who are born in or flocking to these cities full of hope, ambition, wanting to learn about the and connect with the outside world. And if we don't give them that, if we cut that off for economic reasons or other reasons, we will just be missing the biggest opportunity to expand our capacity globally for learning, for enhancing culture, for indeed, in a way, for civilization. Well, it seems to me that case is well made uh, in terms of the power of these new approaches in bringing learning, perhaps for the first time, to much of the developing world. But you've gone on to make and this is the final thought, really, you've gone on to make a second argument that there are experiences you're seeing out there which really could change things in the developed world. I just want to finish by exploring that thought. Um, What we've seen over the last 10 years in developed world school systems is an interest in getting all of the interventions perfectly right recognising that this is a bit like some 18th century clock mechanism and that you are intervening on curriculum, on pedagogy, on assessment, on teacher recruitment and training, leadership, metrics, really everything. So as you 
arguably, import these brilliant insights into teaching and learning from Brazil or Venezuela or India into Birmingham, Boston. Are you not, in the end, making them simply an improvement into what is, frankly, a much more complex educational system and problem? Or can you uh, really see a way to crack what we've all seen as the holistic system crisis of developed world systems by borrowing on what you're seeing in the developing world? Well, there's no doubt that the, 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 um, the big story about education systems is their ability to absorb and uh, adapt change to their own ends in a way. So radical and disruptive potential comes in and it becomes, whether it's in the form of computers or television or whatever it is, new forms of school, and often they get reabsorbed and the kind of traditional form of the school kind of re-emerges. Um, so there is that, I think there is that danger. I would say two things, really. I would say one is that there are places where our systems... I mean, not in the best places like Finland, maybe, but in the UK, there are places where our systems still fail so abjectly that the case for radical change on this method, if you took some of these lessons to uh, Withenshaw in Manchester or Thanet in Kent, um, I don't think you get worse outcomes. I think you get better outcomes by bringing in some of these socially entrepreneurial approaches and just reconceiving how education took place, where it took place, why it took place, you know, motivating people to change. Because so much of the challenge is really about cultural change and aspiration in these places. So the first thing is, I would start with places where there's abject failure and so the risks of innovation are low. And the second is that I do think that whilst... I do, I do think that as we adapt our school systems, and education systems, this pressing question, what are we educating for? Are we teaching for the test? Are we hitting the target but missing the point? You know, what skills and capabilities in, a, in an economy like ours in the UK, where actually innovation, creativity, again, are absolutely central to everything that we do, what kind of school system should we really want then to, to make that work? That question will just keep nagging back. It's not going to go away. And so, you know, if you look at um, Tony Wagner's book, um, the, the Global Achievement Gap, and in, in which Tony suggests a curriculum based on questions and challenges rather than knowledge, sounds like a radical idea. But actually, in these socially entrepreneurial schemes, that's what they do. They start with questions. So there are lessons that we can learn from this. Just as much, I, I do think that you know, it's worth going to Finland, it's worth going to Canada, the best schools in Canada and Australia, the charts on the best charter schools and what have you. We can learn from many different places. But this gives you a perspective on what is possible, which is different, because it's extreme, because they lack resources, they've got big need. They give you an insight into what might be part of the future and how a different kind of learning system might work. Much more distributed, probably much more modular, much more motivational, different kind of workforce, different kind of places where learning takes place. Charlie, thank you. Uh, learning from the extremes is an incredible input to the education debate and thinking through how learning should be in the 21st century. It was a bold survey, 100 vignettes, uh, but the uh, conclusions, I think, justify everything you did. So thank you again, and we look forward uh, to your next adventure uh, and hearing what became of it.